Amazing. Uh, my pleasure to be chatting today with uh, Mikey Shoes. That's that's the nickname you operate under, correct? That's what people say. Mikey Shoes, Michael Schumann of Queens of the Stone Age. You guys uh, got a big show coming up at the Dome. This is actually the kickoff for the tour, is it not? The April 1st show. It is. Is there anything special that you guys do for like a, a kickoff show for the tour? Is there anything special you do for the show, for warm up, anything along those lines? No, I mean we have our rituals and our routines, but not for uh, not for our first show. Um, but uh, I'm excited that we're coming back there. We've done that venue a couple times, and uh, I love it there. Is there is there something in particular you like about the dome, like the history of it? Like it's it's an older building for sure, right? Yeah, well, it's like, isn't it? I mean, it's like it's like that old rodeo building, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. 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 I remember. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, it's yeah. great. Shh. There's just some kind of vibe to it. That's yeah. Yeah, I I find. Like yeah, I, I find, yeah, like obviously it's a it's a landmark here. It's iconic. And I, I find sometimes just being in there, like thinking about the history, you know, all the all the bands that have been there previously, all the games that have been ba played there previously. There's there's an aura to it, right? I guess so. You you tell me. I mean, I don't I don't know <laughs> history that well uh, or hockey history or rodeo history, but uh, I'm sure there is history. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's talk personally about Mikey Shoes. OK, you have one hell of a resume, man. Bass player for Queens of the Stone Age, arguably one of the, the biggest bands in the world today. Uh, many, many side projects and solo projects you've done. Mini Mansion, Wires on Fire, Jubilee, most recently GLD. That's glue, right? That's right. Glue. And I've also seen that you were in The Wedding Singer. That's right. And how did that opportunity come to be? I mean, it was the opportunity of a lifetime, um, really. Uh, no, my uh, my my dad was uh, worked in film, and he was a uh, producer, I think, on that on that movie. And I was, I don't know, eleven years old, and uh, a little Jewish boy, um, and uh, I fit the part perfectly, obviously. Um, so I was just on set one day and they needed someone to, to do this little thing. And so I did it and now it's all over Wikipedia and people get to ask me <laughs> questions about it that I don't really remember. So like, did, did you get to meet Adam Sandler? Was, was he as nice as he appears to be? Yeah, actually. Um, I mean, I was so young, but you know, I started playing guitar when I was seven and, and my dad did this other movie called Bulletproof, um, and I think that was before Wedding Singer. And I ended up going into his his trailer and we ended up playing like Beatles songs like together. And and like two days later, I got home from school and my dad had brought home like just a little practice amp and this like like Epiphone Les Paul copy. Mm -hmm. And Adam was like, I want him to have this. It was in so he gave me that and yeah, I still have it. I think somewhere I gave it to a friend, but yeah, Woo. it was really nice. You still, you still have it. Well, somewhere, somewhere, there's some it's connection. Somewhere, it, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And so, is this what kind of spurred on your love for film and music? Because I know you've also been a part of like doing scores and musical soundtracks for a, a variety of different films. Yeah, I, I, I just think I, as I've, as I've, you know, done all kinds of music endeavors. For so long, I think it's just it was another opportunity that I got into uh, as an adult to it's just a different avenue um, to create music. And it's a cool way to create music that isn't so, I guess, so close to you and doesn't represent you as a human being so much. You're you're making music for someone else or for a scene or for a character. And so I think it's a cool way to to create and get out of yourself uh, rather than like the daily grind of like making records and and being so vulnerable and, and all that stuff so i think it's just a really cool um other avenue for me and i want to continue to do it as much as possible yeah because you've it's a hard world to be in. it's a hard world in what sense i mean there's just kind of there's just kind of like the john williams and the hans zimmers and, the, and there's like that echelon <laughs> okay. and so to really like unless and i'm not like uh i'm not I'm not an arranger, you know, string arranger. So to get to that level is a whole another thing. So to be able to create scores based on, you know, uh, I guess different musical talents um, is a tough. It's a tough game, um, and I'm just I'm just figuring it out, you know. 
Because you're oh, yeah. you're a you're a multi instrument instrumentalist. You know, you you play a variety of different instruments. Sure. So you know, to to put all of that together into a score, you know, obviously difficult. But I, now that you mention this, it it reminds me of I had a, a music teacher in high school, and he always used to talk about musicians having a third ear. He always be like, oh, you know, musicians always have like a a third ear. How they can hear, you know, a different... third ear is that like a third eye. Yeah, yeah, Zoom... Sim... yeah okay, yeah, right, sim... similar to that. And he always talked about how you know these these composers have this like this third ear that they can hear all of these tiny different little things. And the guys like you're mentioning, Hans Zimmer and and John Williams and stuff like that, they have this this third ear. They can hear one string that's that's out of tune four rows back in the in the the bass right so to yeah. get to that is obviously uh, a big task it is i mean and and to know all the instruments in an orchestra and the different tunings the different you know timbres and 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 how they all fit into a score uh and an orchestral arrangement is just a whole nother skill and you know uh to hold another craft that you really have to learn and I, i'm not i'm not trained like that i'm not um you know i i took guitar lessons when i was young but i grew up on punk rock so there's not too much <laughs> i can do you know do that and there's not too much overlap really is is that something you're working towards though like would you like to you know continue to to build that aspect of your life the the passion project of it so to speak i would i would i mean i, I I get so consumed by what we do, Queens, and and you know making records. And once we're on tour, I'm just pretty locked in. And it's it takes kind of all of you emotionally and physically. Like we talk about on tour, I start to feel bad that like I'm in whatever city and and I'm not taking in the sights or I'm not doing enough. But we talk about it, and we're like, you know it really does even though it's subconscious physically and emotionally and mentally it you're building up to just playing that show that night mm -hmm. so it takes so much out of you and i always i bring a rig on tour to create music and i rarely end up doing much because it's just you give everything you got for those two hours that night and um so it's really tough so when i get time at home and i get a break i'll try to do it but mm -hmm. um yeah, this band we give everything to it, so it's it's hard. Well, that's that's amazing to hear, though. You know, obviously the fans are going to love that, knowing that like you're you're kind of sacrificing the stuff that you like you you can be really passionate about to to give everything you can in this thing that you're passionate about for the fans. You know, you wanna you wanna give it all for the show, right? Oh yeah, I mean, and not and not just that, but you know, we we give up being you know with our family and our friends to to get on that you know pirate ship and 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 go out and and uh play for everybody it, we, yeah we give up a lot but also it's like we we can't really do anything else it's all we it's all we really know how to do and and it means so much and it, and it gives us so much life and um you know during COVID I, I felt a little unlike myself and until i got back on tour i realized that's such a big part of me um that i that i need um so getting that back from the fans is so so important it really is okay let's let's continue to focus on the the queens of the stone age stuff here for just a second obviously got to be huge feelings for you to know that after you joined queens of the stone age um that was when they finally this when you guys finally had your first number one record with like clockwork that's got to be a huge feeling for you it was um it was a surprise you know like when i joined i was 21 years old so i was joining a band that i looked up to immensely and was one of my favorite bands but to be a part of us growing and growing and growing um and and ending up getting that that number one record it was actually a big deal i mean i i, I didn't think i'd care but when it happened and because that record making process was so difficult and took so long, it really ended up <laughs> being really emotional for me, mm -hmm. actually. Um, uh, I had to hold back a few tears um, because, yeah, you, you, work, you work hard. I, I don't really give a shit about awards and whatever. I think they're they're meaningless and it's all politics and whatever. But, but that's just like saying that, you know, we've connected with 
our fans and they're supporting us. And so that's what really what it meant um, that we've reached this many fans and, and, and that that's all we do it for really. Um, so yeah, it meant a lot for sure. Yeah. Cause like you guys, you guys are, are making music that you want to make, you know, you're, you're not doing it just to, to sell records. You're, you're doing, you're, you're making what you want to make. And the fact that that's you've it. connected with so many people making exactly what you wanted to make, that's gotta be huge. It is. It is. Yeah. And and, and and every record, like even on this record, where um, you're unsure by the eighth record, which is really hard for bands to get to. Um, and most bands, when they get to their eighth record, it's usually, to me, I see it as a promotional tool for those bands to go on tour. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, with this record, it was, you know, a, critics and and fans you know thought it was our best record yet which was surprising to me because you get so caught in the weeds and don't even realize if it's good or not or whatever but um to hear that back was actually really important after all these years you know so how how involved are you and like the rest of the band in the the songwriting process and the the making of the record as a whole? Like is it is it like heavy Josh stuff or you know is it is it a full on collaboration with you guys and the rest of the band? We're there every day. Mm -hmm. We're all there every day, uh, making the record. Um, I, I'd say you know Josh is our leader. Um, the lyrics come from him. You know, they come from inside him. And I always think it's kind of strange to sing someone else's lyrics. Sometimes it feels like karaoke. I mean, people do great covers and there's nothing wrong with that. But like, I think for us, you know, it does come from Josh. Um, but as far as the songwriting, you know, every song is different. You know, some, some, you know, Josh will come in with a almost completed demo or he'll come up with an idea or we'll just be in a room together and start playing off of one riff and and um but i guess what we all do is whether it comes from josh originally um we all put our stamp on it we're all there you know there's five dudes who have strong opinions who are giving them um and it's a very so it's a very collaborative process and we all trust each other enough um, not just us trusting Josh, but Josh trusting us. Um, and that's why we're all here because we're, we're, we're like-minded, but all individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes our records and these records so different than the, the previous records, right? You can, you can hear everyone's stamp, especially on this record. I think, especially John's playing on this record, I thought was really important. Um, but yeah, we're all very involved. I mean, yeah down to the last one. So would you say that with this latest record, you know, you guys have almost found your rhythm? Because you mentioned that with Like Clockwork, you know, the the process was a little more difficult and, you know, there was there was challenges you faced. So would you say by this point, you guys have, have found your rhythm in, in the writing process? Yeah, I'd say more so, yeah. I mean, they're all awful and difficult to make. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think by this one, because the five of us have you know john joined i don't know 12 i don't know 12 years ago now mm -hmm. 10 years ago um so but now that the five of us have been there for that long i think there is we just gel in a way that maybe we hadn't on the previous record and so there is there's an understanding um about what everyone's role is um there's a trust and i think just the 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 tribulations that we had to go through during making this record, I think just brought us all a lot closer together. Um, I know for me and Josh, um, and I've, I've said this before, but you know, he was my older brother, you know, it's like, I, I, we've always been extremely close, but, but on this record, you know, me and him finished the record together, just me and him the last like 35 days. And so we got even closer than we thought we could have. And so it's really, and it's expanded um, to our touring and how our our shows go. And we feel like we were in the best spot we've ever been um, as a unit. So, you know, I never would have thought that, but it it, it did. And, and, it, and we are there now. Yeah. OK, so based on your contributions to this latest record, uh, there's a regular segment I run on my radio program. It's called Dirty Little B-Side 
what I do is I will play the latest single that has been delivered to us. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that being Paper Machete. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, it, it used to be that records were released or singles were released with a B-side. Don't really do that anymore, but I, I want to give some, you know, some light to the deeper tracks on the record. So is there a song that you think would be the perfect B-side on this latest record to Paper Machete? Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't call it a B-side again, but I, I would say Negative Space is probably, it's like chunky little sister you know it's like it's it, they they kind of go together um they're different tempos but they they kind of fit in the same world so that's what i would say yeah okay all right i will I'll, uh, I'll be sure to do that for you on friday we'll do paper machete right. and then we'll go into that for our our dirty little b-side is what we'll do sweet all right uh, i want to say thank you so much for your time today i really appreciate it mikey shoes uh be sure to check out the latest record from Queens of the Stone Age in Times New Roman. And be sure to check out the very first show on this upcoming tour, April 1st at the Dome. I'm going to be there. I can't wait. Can't wait to see you there. I hope everyone comes out. Yeah, we can't wait to start this Canadian tour. It was important to us to, to hit all the Canadian cities, really. It Hell yeah. Really Hell yeah, man. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Best of luck with the tour. Thanks, man. Appreciate hey. it. Nice talk. Cheers.